Um, we'll do a little switch now from the uh, from what has been current in the U.S. with um, Gallium 68 uh, NetSpot approval and Lutathera approval to um, a little bit of a peek into the future and um, and some of the things that Lindy talked about. And without much further ado, um, I will bring up Dr. Richard Baum, and who will be getting the Saul Hertz, will be giving the Saul Hertz lecture on Monday. Um, so congratulations on that, and welcome. Thank you, Josh, and uh, welcome all. Um, we have uh, done over the last 20 years uh, over 6,000 treatments and got a lot of experience and new ideas um, how to improve this therapy. And as Josh mentioned, uh, this is uh, mostly not routine, what I will show you today, but uh, it also reflects uh, some experience we have. So I will speak on PRT of G3 grade three neuroendocrine neoblasms, which uh, are not yet standard. So approvement uh, for Ludotera is for G1 and G2, well-differentiated tumors. Uh, I will give you some insight on intra-arterial PRT, so injecting the activity directly into the hepatic artery. Uh, some slides on using the end agonists and uh, what could be the advantage then you heard uh, many rumors about uh, alpha emitters and uh, I will show you some results with actinium. One patient is sitting here. And uh, also what is very exciting for us uh, is a total body uh, PET CT called Explorer, uh, which might uh, bring down the imaging time in future for you quite considerably. So we recently published a paper on uh, use of PRT in grade three neuroendocrine tumors. And uh, I will just show you <coughs> the uh, results on what is called PFS, so progression free survival when the disease is stable. And uh, also on what is more important uh, is a so-called median overall survival, uh, which uh, was around uh, 20 months. Um, so you see that in G3 tumors, the uh, prognosis and uh, time of uh, stabilization of the disease and overall survival is less than in this grade one and three tumors, uh, in one and two grade, which is well known. Uh, and uh, our results are quite in line with those from the Nordic group, uh, which is uh, Sweden, uh, Norway, uh, mainly, um, and uh, they are obviously better than those for chemotherapy um, overall, but uh, there is no prospective randomized clinical trial up to now, though one must be a little bit careful, but uh, the data look relatively good. Um, we have uh, algorithm we, we have in place now for deciding if a, if a patient is suitable uh, suitable for um, PRT if uh, the patient has a G3 tumor, so everything is uh, decided by the KI67, which you hopefully all know uh, is a proliferation rate of the tumor. Um, and there are those with a proliferation between 20 and 55 percent, and those over 55 percent. So, those with this high proliferation usually do not express somatostatin receptors are not enough somatostatin receptors. And you can uh, decide on that by using uh, glucose PET or FTG PET. Um, and uh, then we say those uh, having a good somatostatin receptor expression and are negative for FTG, that means probably have more um, lower proliferation rate, uh, we treat with PRT, those were all the markers are positive. We call this a match pattern. We combine PRT with radiocyzing chemotherapy, mainly CAPTEM, for about uh, two weeks. And uh, for those patients, negative with uh, somatostatin uh, receptor imaging and positive for FTG, uh, they are going immediately to chemotherapy as well as those with a high proliferation rate. 
Um, the second topic is uh, actually uh, intra-arterial use. Uh, this is an example from the German Cancer Research Center in the same patient where they injected uh, here uh, intravenously and as you can see here intra-arterially. So just by, by eyeballing the uptake uh, is much higher in this very hyperized uh, tumors which we call a first pass effect. So more of the injected activity is going to the tumors, not only for imaging, but also for therapy. Um, our data confirmed this about uh, 3.75 fold, uh, the data from Heidelberg. And uh, we have done, uh, meanwhile, uh, over 60, but these are data, data on uh, uh, 56 patients. You see most had pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors and uh, mid-gut tumors or small bowel tumors, but we have also treated meningiomas, glomus tumors, um, paragangliomas, pheochromazotomas, and so on. And uh, the results are quite interesting because we found <coughs> a significant difference between those patients having only liver metastases uh, on PET-CT imaging uh, and those patients with additional extrahepatic uh, disease. Uh, so you see for those patients uh, without extrahepatic disease, uh, median overall survival is quite long. Uh, quite surprising because most of these patients had uh, very heavy um, metastatic load uh, in the liver. And uh, one can also combine, as I will show you, um, intravenous and intraarterial therapy. What about toxicity? Actually, we have seen no toxicity. So this is in uh, striking contrast to SEAT, to selective internal radioembolization therapy or to TACE, where you always have some damage uh, to the liver. So radio-labeled peptides are not causing any damage to normal uh, liver tissue. Um, to demonstrate what is possible and uh, to drive it uh, to, the, to the highest complication, so to say, I would like to uh, present a case of a patient who is sitting in front of me. Uh, who was uh, actually 46 years old when we started uh, the disease. Proliferation rate was uh, 10% and um, Josh had uh, what we call the Werner Morrison syndrome, uh, which is a very uh, bad disease caused by the excretion of the vasointestinal peptide with diarrhea, with de dehydration, very severe diarrhea up to 15 or 20 bowel movements uh, per day, uh, initial uh, nausea, weight loss, and, and so on. And I think you had all of this in, in some way. And uh, then we, this is just an overview, uh, gave uh, four treatments, uh, the first now nearly exactly 10 years ago, uh, with a relatively high dose of yttrium-90 uh, dodatate uh, IV, then a combination of yttrium-90 and lutetium, uh, DODATOC, also given IV. Uh, then another treatment in 2015 um, with relatively high dose yttrium uh, again and lutetium, what we call tandem therapy. And the last treatment was in February 2016, uh, combining yttrium and lutetium uh, and agonist. Uh, which might be uh, the, the, the most what we can achieve concerning efficacy. Uh, these are the scans over the years. You also see that we had uh, different PET-CT scanners. Uh, at this time uh, in 2008, which is uh, on the upper row left, uh, you see that there were uh, the whole liver um, occupied with uh, metastases. Um, we did then uh, treatment with yttrium-90 and tandem therapy and as you can see over the years uh, the metastasis, for example, this is April 2012, about uh, four years uh, later than the initial treatment there is regression of the disease and what was very interesting if you look at the FDG PET in uh, 2009 and in April 2012 you see two things, namely first uh, CFDG PET became completely normal, so the, the proliferative tumors were really killed by the therapy, and the liver itself became much smaller, which is uh, always a, a good sign. 
Then we followed up 2013, 14, and then uh, we had a new PET scanner, as you can see here, with a higher resolution, so you see the lesions better. Uh, and then there was, uh, over the years, some, some progression, and we restarted treatment. Uh, this is a scan here on the left, uh, taken in February 2016, before the fourth treatment, which consisted of intra-arterial treatment plus uh, intravenous uh, treatment given at the same day, in the same session in the afternoon, so to say. And then the follow-ups can uh, show, uh, again, a quite good response. And this is the last scan from March this uh, year, which showed even after such a long time after the last uh, treatment, namely three years, <coughs> still some regression of the disease. And this is something um, I would really like to stress, that we are not only having a direct effect of the radiation on the tumor cells, killing tumor cells, but that there is obviously also some anti-angiogenic effect. So the tumor vessels uh, are also irradiated uh, by the radiation, and they are very radiosensitive, this neovasculature, and that can have a very long-term uh, effect. We published another case uh, four years after the NETA-1 trial where the metastases still were regressing. So don't do imaging too early or don't do conclusions too early. Uh, just uh, take a little time to do it. What is also amazing, uh, if you look at the blood counts here, uh, red blood cells, white blood cell platelets in May 2009 and 10 years later, uh, you see that the counts are totally unchanged, so there is zero hematological toxicity, and uh, the same is true also for the renal function, uh, which means that we did a good job. First, we have good kidneys, Josh, and second, we did a good job in giving you uh, enough amino acids and uh, other substances like uh, chelofusine and so on really to block uptake uh, by the kidneys. So uh, in summary, for intra-arterial therapy, um, I think it is mostly for large and inoperable uh, liver metastases expressing high amounts of somatostatin refactors. I think it's effective if we look at our follow-up data. It's uh, really well tolerated and safe. Needs, as always, if you are doing treatment of neuroendocrine tumors, uh, very strong, um, you know, multidisciplinary collaboration. In this case, uh, also with the interventional radiologist, which places a catheter, and the patient is uh, brought back to the ward. We infuse uh, over several hours uh, in this case to have this prolonged first pass effect, and uh, then the catheter is uh, removed. Uh, everything really goes uh, relatively smoothly. Uh, patients do not have uh, additional, um, you know, uh, nausea or vomiting or so. We have not observed this uh, in the patient group. And uh, I think one can or should think about this possibility, uh, especially in younger patients who tolerate the treatment uh, relatively uh, well. So the next topic is uh, receptor antagonists. Um, we know from um, many studies, uh, especially what we call autoradiography, so you are using, um, for example, iodine-125 labeled agonist or antagonist, as shown here, uh, that those antagonists target many more sites in the tumor. Or to say it, uh, you know, simply, uh, when you inject uh, the same amount of radioactivity, more of the radioactivity is going uh, to the tumor cells than with the agonist. And this is uh, a comparison in the same patient where you see the uh, agonist, for example, Dodatalk or also Dodatate. And uh, in the same patient, the end agonist, and you can, uh, you know, imagine that uh, there is much more uptake seen in this huge primary tumor, which was nearly 20 centimeters, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. And in addition, one can see a small liver metastasis. This is already 10 years ago when we did the first studies. This is a more recent uh, scan, uh, comparing uh, again uh, here on the uh, left side, uh, Dodatoc, and on the right side, uh, a new antagonist, which is called LM3. And you see that the uptake in, in normal liver is a, bit, a little bit less, and 
therefore you can detect very small metastases. Uh, in this case, even not seen, one metastasis not seen even on MRI, uh, but verified uh, by, by angiography because we have treated this patient later also with intraarterial uh, treatment. And the same is uh, also true for bone metastasis, um, where you can detect many more lesions. If this has a clinical relevance, I don't know, uh, probably not, if you detect 120 or 140. But what is important is that the uptake uh, is really higher uh, with the antagonist. Though this is something uh, you probably can understand that uh, here on this axis you see the uh, overall uptake and then <coughs> the substance, the compound remains for some time in the tumor. Uh, which we call uh, tumor half-life, and uh, the half-life is longer and the uptake is higher, though the what we call area under the curve, AUC, uh, is really higher for the antagonists, and uh, we have proven that uh, in many patients now with what we call dosimetry, uh, though this is not just a probe measurement, as you just heard, but this is a whole process of five scans over uh, at least 72 hours, uh, in addition SPECT CT, which we can perform, and then you see the uptake in whole body, also in normal tissue, but also in metastasis, uh, is up to eightfold uh, higher. Again, uh, an example on the left, uh, a patient with uh, Nodaga LM3 PET, very nice uptake into liver metastasis, the same patient <coughs> imaged uh, about one week before we stole our talk, a uh, very weak uptake. Uh, this is the angiogram and the MRI. And this on the right side is uh, the image under therapy. So one can use lutetium-177 as a very nice imaging agent. And I would strongly recommend to do that because you get a lot of information from the scan. It's of course difficult in outpatients uh, probably to, to do that. but. You can also use these lutetium scans, which are not an additional uh, burden uh, concerning radiation for the patient, also for follow-up uh, after therapy. Then uh, alpha therapy, targeted alpha radiation therapy, or ART. Um, the alpha emitters have <coughs> what we call a higher energy transfer, linear energy transfer is about 100 times greater than for beta emitters. So lutetium, uh, in many cases, just uh, hits one strand of the DNA, and that can be repair, uh, repaired, whereas the alpha emitter, as you can see here, really completely destruct uh, the DNA. So if an alpha hits uh, a tumor cell, it is really killed. There is no, no way to repair this damage. And uh, we have, meanwhile, treated uh, 20 patients with actinium, uh, Dola TOC, uh, intra arterial uh, application <laughs> is sitting here um, uh, in five patients. And uh, those patients were all very difficult patients, L like you. Okay. So they have been uh, treated, they have been treated before by lutetium, by yttrium, by sear, by taste, by chemotherapy. Uh, so really nothing, nothing left as an additional option. Uh, this patient here is a, is a very interesting patient. I know her since 17 years. She, she has been in our care and she was always stable. You, you see that the patient had hemihepatectomy in addition, so a large metastasis uh, some years was removed. And then uh, suddenly, uh, last year, between January and September, the patient exploded. Uh, nobody knows why this happens, but uh, in some patients they, they are really stable for a decade and then there is progression of the disease. I have my personal opinion in some cases and I think I know what is going on, which is uh, really a, a stress, so negative stress a patient had, partner is dying, accidents, uh, children uh, making problems and so on. Uh, you can find this in, in many of these patients. And then uh, we treated this patient uh, with intraarterial actinium, just a small amount of activity, just 8.4 megabecquerel, not gigabecquerel. Okay, this is a factor 1,000 less than used for lutetium. 
and you see that there is a very nice response which is by the way ongoing uh, and the patient is, is doing very well and uh, the metastasis is becoming smaller. I just would like to show um, very shortly that there are also new radioisotopes for PET imaging, uh, which are interesting, like Scandium 44 here on the right side, uh, you see an image. Uh, on the left side, the same patient uh, image with Scallium. So one can even see smaller metastases uh, with, a, with a Scandium, and it has a longer half-life, so logistics are easier, or even uh, 152 terbium as uh, shown here which has a half-life of 17 hours so you could travel uh, over 100 miles or thousands of kilometers uh, and still do your PET CT scan um, which uh, is not possible with, with gallium of course and uh, at the end I would like to show something which I'm very excited about uh, which is called Explorer Actually, it was uh, developed at uh, UC Davis uh, by Simon Cherry and Ramsey Badawi, which I just visited uh, two days ago. And uh, they asked different uh, vendors if they are interested in building the machine, but uh, got a negative answer. So finally, in China, there was uh, a company who said, OK, we will do it uh, in Shanghai. And um, the difference to the normal pet you can see here is the number of rings. So the length of uh, the PET scanner is about 194 centimeters, <coughs> which allows to image uh, the body at once. And that is giving you a, a, an amazing short imaging time of just 15 to 16 seconds uh, for a whole body. Uh, resolution is very good. This is shown again here. The physical principle and these are images which you also can find uh, by YouTube. Uh, one minute scan from uh, skull to feet with uh, FTG, with glucose in this case, with a very good resolution and uh, of course I'm mostly excited in the possibility uh, to do dynamic uh, PET CT imaging which will uh, allow uh, probably uh, more accurate uh, dosimetry also in <coughs> some patients to do and uh, to do better quantification uh, of this scan. So it's not only that you as a patient have profit from the shorter acquisition time, but uh, nuclear medicine physicians uh, will have a, a great uh, much more information uh, on the tumor behavior and our response to, to therapy. So this is uh, the group here, Simon Cherry, Ramsey Badawi, this is the first subject which was uh, imaged, and this is me in the scanner. Uh, my, my hair are not getting white because of radiation, but because of the, of the light here shining on me, and uh, thank you very much for your attention.